And if you would do me a favor, as you're having a seat, make your way over to Hebrews chapter 13 and Hebrews chapter 1. I'm going to do something a little weird here. Uh, Don't think I'm weird. I don't know if it's because I'm going to sit right here if that's all right. Hopefully nothing blows up. But I don't know if it's just because I'm in a bad mood because I got jury duty tomorrow or that that game yesterday. Jeez. But something happened, you know, when I got in trouble, not that anyone's in trouble, but anytime there was a troubled time or something serious, you know, and my mom or my dad would come and just sort of sit down in my room or or, or say, hey, everybody come to the living room and have a seat. Let's let's have a conversation about a situation or whatever it might be, you know, sort of that moment where it's time to just get reflective. Um, I've been feeling that way lately. Um, This series, it's in October, and we did this series, Supernatural, because it is October, and this is sort of that time, you know, Halloween's around the corner, and this is not about your views on that or this, but just sort of that season where it just makes sense to talk about uh, these supernatural things. We're going to get to that here in just a second. Um, but something sort of hit me the other day, and it's, it's uh, this reality that I just waste a lot of time. Anybody else with me? It's okay. We can be honest here. We're all a family. Look at the person next to you and say, be honest, God is watching. I'm just joking. You don't have to do that. <laughs> I I just feel like I just waste a lot of time. Um, I was driving, I don't even know where I was going, but I was leaving my house, going to run an errand. And I saw these two cars behind me, and and they were right there, and I could see kind of they were talking to each other through the window, and I could see them in the rear view. And I sort of slowed down and let them pass me, and again, they're in front of me now, and they're talking, and they're having a conversation. I was like, oh, cool, two friends. And it was really neat because it was like people with major differences. One guy had an Oklahoma tag, other guy had an Arkansas tag. I mean, it was you know, two people coming together, uh, just having a good relationship. And then I noticed the hand gesture from the guy on the Arkansas plate is not the hand gesture you give a friend, right? And so I realized, oh, these guys are arguing. These guys are fighting. These, there's something going on that, you know, I'm not aware of, but there's a problem here. And I just watched these guys drive down the road. And for whatever reason in my mind, I thought, man, what a waste of time. I thought for, for a moment about the reality of even this series. The reason um, I think this series has happened is to be reminded that there's something really big out there happening in our world. And I don't know if you feel the tension, but this is that time of year definitely in our country where we start to feel the tension, you know. There's this little thing happening in about 12 days, you know, it's called an election, right? Right? Um, And you might feel the tension a little bit. I know I feel the tension a little bit. I hear people have conversations about, you know, can you believe our neighbor put their sign in their yard? You know, um, we're not going to talk to them anymore, you know. And so I feel that tension. And I just think to myself at some level, the amount of time that we waste Getting our minds, our hearts focused on things that are very temporary and not eternal. I, 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 and I think about this for myself, and I hope you know this about me. And listen, if you're visiting this morning, we're so glad you're here. This is not what I normally do, so please come back next week, all right? And I'll stand on the stage the whole time and won't sit here and say strange things, all right? But we just waste so much time. God has given us... Um, a glimpse into the reality of warfare. God has given us a glimpse into the reality of a spiritual battle that is happening, and it's happening day in and day out for the sole purpose to distract and derail people from the truth of a living God. To distract and derail people from the gospel of Jesus Christ to distract and derail believers from engaging even into the mission of Jesus. I just feel like I waste a lot of time. Not focusing in on what's eternal, not focusing in on what matters. This weekend, we we were at our state convention, and somebody was preaching a sermon, and they took out a dime very quickly 
and just said, you know, I, this, this dime reminds me of a sermon that a mentor preached, and I'm just reminded all the time of different things in different situations, and I use this acrostic from a dime that just simply is, does it matter eternally? Does it matter eternally? Now, I'm not sitting here trying to, you know, preach legalism where you can't ever do anything fun or go out and just take care of stuff and have a good time and enjoy life. Yes, God wants you to be a part of that. But at the end of the day, the call on the Christian's life, the call on my life is to waste less time on the temporary. Every time somebody approached Jesus to say, I want to follow you, you know what Jesus did? Jesus gently but straight to the point said, okay, this is what it means then for you to follow me. What it means for you to ultimately follow me is to move away from the temporary, whether that be comforts of life, whether that be the comforts of your family, the comfort of your own personal safety. To follow means, me means that you Move away from these eternal comforts and focus on eternity because in a hundred years, all that's going to matter is Jesus. And so I wonder if you would do me a favor before we get into uh, the word today. Um, I wonder if you would take some time and pray that you would waste less time, that we would waste less time, and that we would walk out of these doors today convicted and challenged to evaluate our life, to evaluate our days. And again, I might be just in a bad mood because I'm going to be in jury duty tomorrow. <laughs> I wonder if we would consider what we would have to do this week to fill the empty seat next to you. What would we need to do to get our hearts and minds to a place where we are so focused on the eternal realities? That Jesus is real. The salvation is real, and it's possible for every single person. And that as we see people engage with one another, we're reminded that what they need more than anything is Jesus. I wonder if we would just take the time this morning as we look at eternal things and ask ourselves this question. What do I need to do this week to get focused on more eternal things? To finally invite that coworker, to finally invite that neighbor, to finally consider the folks around us and, and ultimately what we're here to do as we live our lives, where we live, work, and play. And that's to point as many people to Jesus as possible and to leverage our life, to leverage our time, to leverage our talents, to leverage our treasures towards the advancement of the gospel. And I wonder if you would, if you have an empty seat in front of you, next to you, behind you, a empty 18 inches or 25 inches, I don't know, of pew, whether you would pray, Lord, help me to focus in this week on wasting less time on what's temporary and focusing more of my time on what's e eternal. Because here, here's what I know to be true, and there's a whole lot of conversation we can have about the realities of that in our personal lives, Monday through Saturday. But here is a fact, and this is just a reality of it all. When you gather with the body of believers on Sunday morning, it is never a waste of time. And imagine gathering with the body of believers and bringing someone with you who needs to hear the truth of the gospel, the unchurched, the de-churched, whoever it is in your life that you know is not engaged in the body of Christ. Imagine if we just decided week in and week out that our prayer is going to be and our activities in our life are going to be driven by we're going to get people to church, and they're going to hear the gospel, and they're going to see people worshiping, and we're going to leverage our time and our treasures and our talents to get people focused in on the only thing that will matter when it's all said and done, and that's Jesus. And so if you would, before we get into God's Word, would you just bow your head? Would you take a moment as I walk back up to the stage as you, you just take a moment and you pray. And those of you that are, that are engaged and you're, I'm challenging you to pray that you would waste less time this week on things that are temporary. 
And that God would put on your heart a person or two, a neighbor, a family member, a friend. And that you would make a commitment to spend your week leveraging all that God has blessed you with to point people to Jesus. And at the very minimum, invite them to church. You pray. Lord, I do pray that that is just the spirit that believers have this morning, that we'll be in that spirit of prayer this entire morning as we get in your word, that, Lord, we're reminded as we look at these eternal things of the reality of what's happening in this world that we can't see all the time. And that at the end of the day, the things that distract us distract us from the most important thing, and that is the advancement of the gospel, our own holiness and sanctification, And that, God, as you continue to stir in my heart, God, maybe it'll be uh, true for some in the room this morning that we'll just begin to evaluate the amount of time we waste, not focused in on the eternal, but on what is temporary. And so, Lord, I, I pray that for some, they just begin with a name, a person that they'll invite this week, a person they'll take to lunch this week, a person they'll begin to spend time with for the sole purpose to point them to you. And God, at the minimum this week, they'll just take that step to invite them to be with them and worship with them next Sunday. And God, I pray that for every church, that at the end of the day, for all Bible-believing, teaching churches, that God, we would see a movement amongst us that's not driven by the coolest things or the best this or the best that, but just driven by the sole passion to tell people about Jesus. And that when we gather into this place and as we sing and as we are blessed by all the blessing that you've given us and the abilities that we have to worship you in the way that we do, to minister to people in the way that we do, that we'll never forget that the sole purpose for all of it, the end result of all of it is the advancement of the gospel. That, Lord, our time is precious. And the time that we have is is like a vapor. It goes so fast. And Lord, I pray that we would dedicate and begin to pray as to how to leverage our time while we're blessed to have it towards the only thing that's going to matter when it's all said and done, and that's you. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I appreciate you doing that. Listen, um, we're in this series, and we have been, as I mentioned earlier, just called Supernatural, as we've been looking at the realities of this supernatural uh, world. And within that supernatural war, war, there is a a world, there's a battle going on. There's a war going on. And there are agents and there there are different created beings that are involved, all under the sovereignty of God. And so we began to look at that as we looked at the armor of God, that the whole purpose of the armor of God is to battle and to fight this spiritual war. And the armor of God is a spiritual armor. And in order to battle a spiritual battle, you've got to put on something spiritual. And ultimately, every component of the armor of God is a gift from him that you use in order to battle and to fight. Salvation and righteousness all comes from the Lord. And so we saw the reality of this armor, and within that armor, what we're reminded of is that our enemy is not against flesh and blood. Look at the person next to you, remind them again, You are not my problem. Go ahead and do that. Now, I ain't saying the devil ain't using them. I'm just saying. Our war is not against flesh and blood. And here's what happens when we begin to sort of live in that. It really does change how we interact with people. It changes how we see people. It makes us a little bit more patient. It makes us a little bit more calm, a little more prayerful as we interact with people that need Jesus. And you start to realize, listen, this person isn't my problem. The problem is, is this person needs to put their faith and trust in Jesus. There's a war happening. There's a battle for souls. There's a battle for distraction. It's why Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come to give you life. Our battle is with this real enemy. It's with this this, uh, real uh, spiritual, demonic, um, 
um, um, these, these created beings that, that exist for the sole purpose to steal, kill, and destroy, to distract people from the message of the gospel. Um, and then after that, we got into who those agents are. We talked about Satan. We talked about demons, this real demonic world that exists that are enemies of God. And as Christians, we believe in those things because God has shown us in his word that these things are real and they're true and that there really is a demonic movement and world out there, again, all under the sovereignty of God. I mentioned this when I talked about this in the, in the sermon, is that there a lot of things that we just don't know. We don't have all the answers to the ins and outs of the reality of it all, but God has given us enough to understand that there truly is a supernatural spiritual warfare battle happening. Satan is real. Demons are real. The enemies of God are real. And that as Christians, we need to know these things because it helps us learn how to fight that battle. It prepares us to understand uh, uh, who these things are so that we don't err by giving them too much credit. Remember, not every bad thing that happens in your life is Satan messing with you or demons messing with you. Remember that? You wake up, you got a bad hair day. That's not get behind me, Satan. You're just having a bad hair day, right? But then also we can err by not giving them any credit whatsoever by just saying, you know, I'm not worried about it. It's, it's, it's kind of silly or, or not really taking the Bible literally when it teaches us about the enemy and about these demonic uh, beings. We read stories that God's word gives us about those that have been inflicted by demonic activity. And so it's real and it's something we need to talk about because the Bible talks about it. But then the Bible also encourages us and reminds us that when we fight this battle, we are not fighting for victory, we're fighting from victory. It is true, the battle is won. And so this morning we're going to continue for a few short moments and we're going to end this series by looking at or taking a glimpse into the reality of angels. The reality of angels. You can turn to Hebrews chapter 13. We'll be there for a minute. Hebrews chapter 1 for a minute and a lot of other passages. Now, here is a, a, I think it's a fact. Many, many people get their sort of understanding or their worldview of angelic activity from the culture. Um, matter of fact, when you hear the word angel, more than likely, you might think of something culturally. You might think of a picture that you saw. You might even think of a movie. Anybody ever seen movies with angels in them? You might even now start to think about certain movies. And I think a lot of people uh, sort of get their view uh, from the culture as to what an angel is and what an angel does. For example, how, how many of you guys are old enough to remember the show Touched by an Angel? Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, which means most people who watch that show, very heartwarming show, uh, you know, nice show, kind of family friendly, if you will. But most people left there thinking that angels are actually women with British accents, right? And that their behavior and how they interacted with people actually is what an angel does. It's sort of nice, don't get me wrong, but not the most theological picture that the Bible paints. Or what about this movie, Angels in the Outfield? Anybody ever seen that movie? Yeah. Great movie. Love that movie. Matter of fact, I wish that was true. I wish there were angels in the end zone last night. You know what I mean? <laughs> I wish that were true. If you're an Aggie, congratulations. Great game. But the angels in the outfield teach us this sort of thing, that there are angels that actually care about baseball, right? And we get our, our view or maybe some of you might have remembered the movie Michael with John Travolta. Anybody ever see that movie? You know, the beer drinking angel that wore tank tops all the time? Not the most theological picture of what an angel is. Or what about the all time Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life? Anybody love the movie, It's a Wonderful Life? It's a great movie. I, I know there are some people that don't like that movie, and it's because you need Jesus, but that's okay. <laughs> But not the most theological movie when it comes to angels. If you'll remember, there is an angel in this movie. His name is what? Clarence. Poor angel. I mean, it's like the archangel Michael. Gabriel. Where's Clarence? All right? You know, it's just kind of not the best uh, name for it. But what happens in that movie? 
Every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. Not true. <laughs> but we sort of live in this world, right? Or maybe some of you got gotten like a get well soon card when you're sick, and maybe on the corner of that card, there's like a, a baby angel in a diaper playing a harp sitting on a cloud. You're like, oh, that's what angels are. They're just a bunch of babies and diapers. No, that would be terrible and gross and doesn't sound like, sounds like a demon to me <laughs> anyway. <sighs> Remember, I got jury duty tomorrow, so <laughs> not in the best mood. <laughs> There is a, a rather common uh, belief, um, and I, I don't know if this is just sort of hopeful, if it does come from movies, but, I, but there are people who actually believe that when a relative dies, that relative becomes an angel. And then by default, that relative becomes your guardian angel who watches over you. Not true, and actually a little creepy. I don't want grandma watching over me all the time, all right? Not, not the, the coolest picture at all. They're just sometimes, I'm like, no, but listen, when a relative dies, they don't become an angel. And so I'm thankful that that's not true. I'm thankful that the way the culture depicts angels, while it's nice and can be warm and fuzzy and it can give us sort of this, you know, little hopeful picture of all this good activity, that's not how the Bible describes angels. Now, the angels, these created beings, these angelic creatures... They are on God's side, if you will, meaning the activity that they do is, is good activity because it's activity that honors the Lord. And so instead of letting culture form our decision when it comes to angels, instead of letting, you know, get well soon cards inform our decision of angels or whether some bad teaching out there or even your own made up version of what an angel does, the most appropriate thing for us to do is to go to God's word instead of our own speculations. Amen. What does God's word say about angels? And this is simply what I'm going to do this morning is I'm just going to rattle off all the things that I've been able to work through and narrow down to give you as Best of insight and glimpse into the angelic activities that exist around us. Hundreds of times are angels mentioned in the Bible. Hundreds of times do we see descriptions of angelic activity. And so as we begin, the first thing I'm going to point you to, this one won't be on the screen, but the first thing I'm going to point you to is this, is that angels are all over. We see this scripture in the text that there are angels who are interacting the way the Bible describes it all the time. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 is. This is a very difficult passage to get our mind around. Remember, when you talk about these supernatural things, they're difficult to understand. Our, our minds are not in a place and in the world that sort of can grasp. these. Our finite minds can't grasp some of the descriptions of the activities of the supernatural, angelic World. Hebrews chapter 13, 2 says this Let brotherly love continue. Don't neglect to show hospitality, for by doing this, some have welcomed what? Angels as guests without knowing it. I mean, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, is that don't stop showing hospitality to people. You never know if that person is going to be an angel or not. I mean, this is a, a, a heavy thing to consider. We see this activity happening. You can read in Genesis 18 and 19, both Abraham and Lot interact with angels who are sort of uh, uh, have this uh, you know, look of, of just common people. And I don't know how it all works. But I know the scripture describes it, and it paints this picture of this world out there that we just can't get our minds wrapped around. Now, I don't know if I've ever entertained an angel or not. I feel like I've entertained a demon or two here or there. But here's what, 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 what I believe. I believe it's quite possible as we start to see what angels do and how angels guide and how angels point people in directions towards certain activities, I believe, whether I know or not, if I've entertained an angel or not, we'll know when we get to heaven. It's quite possible that there have been people in my life and people in your life that have been guided or influenced by the goodness of angelic activity to do good in your life. I think that's possible. I think it's quite possible it's happened in many of our lives. Um, 
you know, we know parenting is difficult, and when you're raising kids through school and you're trying to, you know, advocate for them, make sure they get the, the best this or the, the best that, it can really be a difficult time for parents. Some of you have been through that. We've been through that. It's just part of raising children. Um, I did not know this till later on in my life, but my mother um, and my father was telling us, my brother and I, I have a twin brother if you don't know that, uh, my brother Clay and I, when we started elementary school, uh, the school sort of had labeled us to have all these disabilities. And they were in a position where they were going to place us, you know, in a, in a whole different sort of world of education, which would have probably drastically changed the direction of our life. But there was this one teacher, this one teacher who just began to advocate for us, who began to go to the school. And I thank God for teachers. Let's give it up for our teachers really quick. Yep, love our teachers. But this teacher began to advocate for us and began to comfort our parents and began to tell them, listen, they're, they're fine, they're going to be great, uh, they're behind. I'm going to take my time, my personal time, after school during this time, and I'm going to help them develop to where they, they should be. And this teacher did that, and this teacher took out time to work with us and to get us to a place. And, and really, when I look back on my life and I think about that moment and where we went from there, it was a major, major direction change in our life. And it's quite possible this person influenced to love on a couple of redheaded twins to point them towards a direction, to, to comfort a mom and dad. These are the types of things, and I'm not saying emphatically that's what happened. I'm not saying there was a baby angel on her shoulder or anything like that. I'm just saying as Christians, we need to get a little bit more spiritual about the things that happen in our life. We're so quick to discredit and discount. I've been there. Listen, I'm one of the biggest skeptics. Anytime I'm sitting where you're sitting, which is rare, and somebody starts talking about these spiritual things, I start getting real skeptical. And that may be just the Southern Baptist in me. I don't know. But I do believe for me, when I think about where I am, and I hope that it's where you are too, is that we do need to get a little bit more spiritual about the things that happen in our life because the Bible depicts this activity for us. It shows us that there is this world out there full of angelic created beings, and they're all doing the work of the Lord which is the opposite work of what we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And so when you get into God's Word, and I'm going to go really quickly for the sake of time here, when you get into God's Word, here are some of the activities that we see happening with angels. In Luke chapter 1, 26 and 38, Luke chapter 1, 11 and 20, and I'll go fast if you want these, just email me, I'll get them to you. Matthew 1, Luke chapter 2, we see that angels announce the birth of Jesus. They're involved in the greatest event known to man. The birth of Christ leading to his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. They ministered to Jesus in the wilderness after his 40-day fast in Mark chapter 1. They rolled away the stone of Jesus' grave. They opened prison doors for apostles in Acts chapter 5. They directed evangelists as to the direction they should go like Philip in Acts chapter 8. They spoke to unbelievers like Cornelius about what they should do to find the gospel, Acts chapter 10. They'll come to Jesus, the Bible says, with his second coming. That we're going to see this host of angelic activity at the, the, the second coming of Christ. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be amazing. And regardless of what your positions are, as far as the end time timelines, we can all agree this is going to be a powerful and glorious day when that curtain is revealed. And so we see this sampling of their activity, and there's so much more. We could, talk, we could talk for a long time about the activity that the New Testament describes as far as the angelic activity. And so I just want to give you a few really quick, some specific ones here. The first thing that we see specifically about angels is that angels minister to saints. Angels minister to saints. If you're a believer in the room, you are a saint, and angels minister to us. Hebrews chapter 1, starting in verse 13, it says, Now to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to those who are going to inherit salvation? 
that angels are in some ways employed to minister to those who will be followers of Christ. In other words, that angels and a part of their existence as they exist for the sake of Christians, to minister to them, to those who will inherit salvation. He says, aren't they all ministering spirits? Most amazingly in this text, it doesn't say just some of them are. It says all of them are. Now, if you're a believer in the room, you should be reminded, especially coming off the heels of talking about demonic activity and the reality of an enemy, that we are not left alone to fight the battle and the reality of the spiritual warfare. That God shows us in his word, and I don't know what it looks like all the time, and you don't know what it looks like all the time. We see that there's physical ministering that happens. I mean, these angels come, and they take care of Jesus in his weakest moment when he's tempted in the garden. The Bible even proclaims that angels of legions will come if he calls down on them to minister to him. And then we see the writer of Hebrews saying they'll do the same for believers and ministering to us in our times of need. And again, I don't know what it looks like all the time. This is one of those things we just need to rest in and find comfort in that God has not left you alone. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but just think, how many of you need ministering to today? You get in God's word and you let God's words well richly in you and God will move in you in a way where you are ministered to, where you're comforted by his word and maybe, quite possibly, as strange as it is to even say, ministered to by one of his angelic beings. Well, I'd love to see that, wouldn't you? And I think one of the, one of the things that we draw from this series is that we just need to be more spiritual in our lives. That we need to make room for the amazing, incredible work that God has laid out for us and be less distracted and more focused on these spiritual things. Second thing, angels execute God's will. Psalm 103, 20 and 21. Bless the Lord, all his angels of great strength who do his word obedient to his command. Bless the Lord, all his armies, his servants who do his will. Now you think about this for a second. God is the creator of all things. The Bible even teaches us that that even inanimate objects do what he commands. Animals do the will of God. You can see this in the scripture. I mean, God summons a whale to swallow Jonah. Jonah. The well does what God tells him to do. He even tells his disciples, you're going to find this, you know, in a a fish or a donkey. I mean, your animals are going to do my will. He is the creator of all things. Humans do his will. As followers of Christ, when we submit our lives, we're making the submission and confession and agreement that we're going to obey and do the will of God. And it's true for angels as well. Angels do his will. How do we know that? Three quick things. One, angels are worshipers of God. We see this in the text, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. And then when he presented his honored son to the world, God said, let all the angels of God worship him. Angels are created beings created to worship and do the will of God of the Father. Revelation chapter 5, 11 and 12. Then I looked up and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. Get that picture in your head. What an incredible picture to consider, 10,000 upon 10,000 angels. In a loud voice saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Angels worship Christ. Angels are fighters as well. You can't get this out. Uh, You you can't uh, pass by this in the text. I mean, when you think of angels, this notion of these sort of just sort of you know small little creatures, if you will, or a baby on a a card. But but every time an angel shows up, it's a really big deal. More often than not, their first words are, "Don't be what afraid." I can imagine just the incredible, just how 
awesome. The presence of an angel, this angelic being, would be. Second Kings, the night the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. They're fighters. Angels are warriors. Listen, that night, the angel of the Lord, not 10,000 angels, not 100,000 angels, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in an Assyrian camp. Revelation 12, verse 7 says this, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Angels are fighters. What are they fighting for? The will of the Lord. To execute his will in the heavens and on earth. But probably their most prominent activity is that angels are messengers. God uses angels to send messages to his people. Judges 6, 12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. He's encouraging Gideon through an angel with a message. Luke chapter 1, 30 and 31, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. The angel had a message to Mary. We'll talk about this a lot in December. Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name of Jesus. Angels have messages. And that's just to name a couple. But God uses them to speak his will, to show someone. And think about how important this message needed to be sent to Mary, right? Because if this message is not sent to Mary and she just wakes up one day and she's like, oh, goodness, I have a child. Where did this child come from? Mary, that would have been like, Mary, you're crazy. But God encouraged her with this message through this angel to prepare not just her, but her husband and her family. Because this was a unique situation that required something supernatural. And so God sends this messenger, this angel, to send a message to his people. And so angels execute the will of God. And the last thing here is that angels magnify the greatness of God. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 10, it says this, A stream of fire issued and came out before the Lord. A thousand, thousand served him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. This, this picture this revelation that Daniel is seeing, this court of tens of thousands of angels all surrounding God. Painting a picture of this royal, awesome, incredible moment of just proclamation of the greatness of God. This picture of heaven with 100 million angels standing before him. It's breathtaking. It's incredible. And they're there to sort of paint the picture of this, this, this the reality of his, his royalness, the reality that he is God and his sovereignty, to lift up the greatness of who he is. You know, it is football season, so we'll always use these as illustrations, but I was I was really, it's always impressive. It doesn't matter who your favorite team is. It's always impressive when the home team comes out onto the field, isn't it? Especially when it's a good season, right? We're not talking bad news bears here. We're talking about a real team, good team, having a great season. You think about last night, they just show these, they kept showing these pictures of, of the Aggie Stadium and, and, and 108,000 people are there to watch college football. And then all of a sudden, when that home team runs out on the field, I don't care what your favorite team is, if you're a sports fan, it's just a really incredible moment. And then all of a sudden, the cheers, the screaming, you can almost feel the vibration of the stadium all the way here in Fort Smith. It's a powerful moment. It's a fun moment. But imagine for a second, that's 108,000, 100 million angels all proclaiming the greatness of God. There's no other option when you're in the presence of the Father, is there? 
As a matter of fact, Jesus is going to teach uh, multiple times in different ways that everything is going to worship and proclaim the greatness of God. One way or the other. The rocks are going to do it. You're going to do it. Everyone's going to do it. These angels serve as these examples of pointing people towards the greatness of God. And the songs that they sing, Isaiah has this incredible blessing in many ways to just have a sneak peek, the presence of God and how the angels proclaim his greatness. And it's so powerful and it's so awesome and it's so supernatural Isaiah's response is to immediately say, woe is me, as these angelic created beings cover their face, cover their feet, and as they fly in the air and they sing worthy to a holy God, Isaiah's response is, is woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. Being in the presence of a holy God always causes you to humble yourself and to be reminded of how holy God is. And angels exist to proclaim that greatness. And so the battle is real. The war is real. The greatness of God is real. His angelic created beings executing his will, they're real. And they're, they're here, they're around, and they're, they're doing the will of the Father. Why in the world would we talk about something like this? Well, as believers, the whole point of this is to be encouraged and to be reminded that God is with us. Look at the person next to you and say, God is with you. He's almost done. <laughs> that God is with us. And that God has created angelic beings and there's this realm out there and this reality of this war and it could, it could get heavy and it could be weighty. But as Christians, we always rest in the peace of knowing that God is with us and he has employed his created beings to minister to us, guide us, protect us, show us the way, remind us of the reality of eternity. And that we can go all in knowing that God is with us. And we can begin to have these conversations and discussions about being distracted and wasting less time and focusing more on the eternal and becoming more spiritual in our lives. Listen, I desperately need to do that in my own life. Just to be transparent with you, I've told you for, for 11 years, I am not perfect. And anytime I preach, I preach, I'm preaching to me as well. We all need to be reminded of how important it is to give ourselves over to the reality of eternal things and the description of angelic beings and the description of a real enemy, the description of the armor of God that we need to fight a spiritual battle. It should, it should be the catalyst. It should stir us to want to focus our attention more on what's eternal. And I hope that you get that today if you're a follower of Christ, that today you would consider how distracted you are from eternal things. Angels are real. The enemy is real. The battle is real. Are we ready for it? And in what are those areas in our life where we're not ready for it? And the blessing of God is it gives us opportunities to come into a place like this week in and week out to be encouraged, to be reminded, to be challenged and stretched to consider those areas in our life that we need to focus more eternally on. There's sin in our lives that we need to repent of. Is there activity that's just wasted time that's distracting us from advancing the gospel and leveraging our life towards the one thing that will matter 100 years from now? And as believers, we have the opportunity week in and week out to continue to grow in our faith and be conformed more to his will and to be a part of his activity and his plan to redeem the world back to himself through Christ. If you're not a follower in the, uh, if you're not a believer in Christ this morning, and you're today in this room, then listen. The most important thing you would do today is to submit your life to Jesus. It's the only way. The Bible teaches us it's the only way to be right with God, to confess with your mouth, to believe in your heart that Jesus died and that God raised Him from the dead. And when you do that, you'll be saved, and you're right with God. 
And then you're thrusted into this Christian life waiting on that time when Jesus returns or he takes you home. And we get to do it in an imperfect world and sometimes a crazy world. And we get to find rest and peace knowing that God is real and his sovereignty is real and that he is with us. And so if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, I want to encourage you today to take that step. To take that red connect with us card that's in the chair back in front of you or the pew back in front of you. You can fill it out. You can write on the back. I need a pastor or minister to call me. You fill it out, place it in one of the black boxes. And we'll take it. We'll, fill it. we'll, we'll call you. We'll set up a time. But listen, if you want to talk to someone today about what it means to put your faith and trust in Jesus. In just a second, I'm going to pray. We're going to respond with some more worship. Uh, Allie will come up, give us some parting words, dismiss us to our community groups. If you'd like to talk to someone today about what it means to put your faith and trust in Jesus and how you can do that, I'll be hanging around down front. I would love to talk to you. We'll take all the time we need and help you answer the most important question a person will ever answer, and that's what they believe about Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we do love you. We do thank you. And God, I do pray that as we respond this morning by worshiping you and just considering the realities of the world that we don't see all the time. God, this unseen sort of realm that exists, this supernatural, filled with created beings doing your will, some not doing your will. But God, all the while in the pages of your word, we're reminded of the victory that we already have and that we can rest in that and we can find peace. And that, God, all the things that come our way, God, your promise is that you're going to make all things good. And so, Lord, we rest in that and we find peace in that. And, God, I do pray for those that have never put their faith and trust in you, that today will be a day of salvation for them. Father, we love you, we thank you, we worship you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.